What up, friends? So this is not my kitchen. If uh, you are listening on uh, uh, Stitcher or iTunes or SoundCloud, you can't see, but I'm in a kitchen. <laughs> but uh, we are in Calgary, Alberta, Canada, Mark and myself. And we are here because it's UFC Calgary week. While we're here, you just um, also, if you're listening on podcast, you won't notice the change in lighting. But if you are on YouTube, thank you for watching. And uh, we are in a kitchen of a hotel and we're like, let's just shoot right here. Why not? All we're doing is sharing ideas. You can do that anywhere. Um, our new podcast format, we're trying to do it once a week. Um, I think next week we're going to, it'll be about eight days till we're back. But it is fighting, it, no, it's uh, enjoy the hostilities. This is number two, right? And we're bringing together a bunch of the different ideas so that we can do a long form hangout because that's what we want to do. We want to hang out, share some thoughts in long form where we can dig a little bit deeper. Um, we have a number of different segments we've developed over the last year and a half. Ask Robin Black, um, which we'll do next week. Um, fighting is about fighting, where we talk about the journey and the adventure and the things that we're learning on the path. A little As we travel around analyzing fights, what else do we learn? How else does that help us? Um, and is there anything of value we can share? Um, and then we do some fight analysis. So today, we are going to... Uh, I'm going to share with you some of the stories that I've picked up from my trip so far here, Mark and I's my trip to Calgary, what I've learned from talking to Duke Rufus and Mark Henry and, and Dominic Cruz and Michael Bisping and the people we've gathered some information. So we're going to chat about that for 15, 20, 30 minutes. And then I want to share with you, Mark shot and Mike and got a really great, we got a nice, beautiful look on it, but for our listeners, we got a great sound of my, first Michael Bisping hanging out, chatting, answering some questions from a bunch of our friends, um, um, journalist friends, and then Dominic Cruz and Mike hanging out together. So we're going to include that as our second segment today, and then we're going to wrap this up with a little um, TJ Dillashaw versus Cody Garbrandt 2 talk, because that's only a week away. Right now. I don't know when you're listening to this or watching this, but when we're doing it, it's only about a week away. So let's do that. So before I get into fighting is about fighting and, and share with you some of the interesting things that we've, we've heard, learned, seen um, here in Calgary, I want to tell you a little story about my friend Chael Sonnen. So Chael Sonnen is one of the great minds. We're all, everybody's different, all of us. Chael understands human behavior he and he understands this idea we hear this idea all the time getting in someone's head you don't know what it is until Chael Sonnen gets in your head and you're like oh I get it what does that actually mean when we say that oh is Dom in his head is Connor in his head is who's in his head it means you're actually thinking somebody has you in a little loop where you're like, what's going on here? Why did they do that? Why did they say that? What's happening? So I'll tell you a little story. This is chilling for me. Now, I hope you may find this interesting. Uh, but from my personal perspective, this was some chilling shit. All right. So quick background. Chael Sonnen is a friend, good friend, mentor, and he's been very generous with me. Somebody has been very kind to me and we've uh, shared some conversations and some things. Uh, I think I remember sending ice cream to his home for something that he did, some advice he gave me once. I genuinely appreciate Chael Sonnen. And recently he's been helping me with a few other things. I'll be able to tell you about those in the future maybe or maybe not. Um, but yes, I very much appreciate Chael. So the other morning, my wife and I, I'm in bed. My wife and I are having coffee in bed, and I'm watching something on my phone. And it's Chael Sonnen says Bruce Lee sucks, <laughs> right? I'm like, oh, this is going to be good, right? So I'm watching it. He's like, that guy was a wimp. And then he takes a few stabs at Judo Jean LaBelle <laughs> while he's in there, who I'm pretty sure he's friends with. So I'm watching this, and, I, and my wife, who, you know, has never met Chael in person, but knows that he has been a, a, a big influence on me and a big and a and a very helpful mentor. She's like laughing. She's like, "Oh man, he's he's really going for it." And I'm laughing too, because part of me now, first of all, don't fuck with Bruce Lee. That's my guy right there. And to d debate this or discuss this with Chael would actually be fun. Um, 
because the influence of Bruce Lee is in his philosophies, the way that he sees the world, the way he interacted with the saw the world, interacted with the world, the way that he drew, drew comparisons to life from art and martial arts and the artist of the artistry of living. Um, but Chad was not incorrect when he pointed to the fact that he was small and he didn't fight much and stuff. So it's not, Chael's never, is rarely going to be wrong. But anyway, so I'm laughing at this because there's, you know, I know that part of, to be a great entertainer, and Chael is a great entertainer, and to be a great influencer. And Chael is the definition of the modern influencer. He influences thought, he influences debate, he influences action. This, when people say, oh, he's, a, he's got a phone, he's an influencer. Chael Sonnen is the definition of an influencer. Anyway, so he's influenced me to respond to this laugh at it. So I'm in that mode. So I carefully craft a tweet. Something like, Chael Sonnen is my friend, but don't fuck with Bruce Lee. Don't make me. And then I'm like, I have to like, I have to put a stab at him. You know, he, Cody Covington's his, his friend and he likes the Connor. He's always had sizzle, you know, uh, uh, the Brazilian kids are playing in the muck. Like, you know, he's got a sense of humor about this. I'm like, I got to make him laugh here. So I take a stab at his town, Westland, Oregon, because that's a good old professional wrestling thing to do. It's like, this place is a shithole. And I said, don't make me come over there and slap you. I'm looking at him, I laugh, send. So that would have been the end of that. And, uh, you know, a couple hundred people retweeted, like 97% of which have insight into the fact that that's not actually how I normally behave. Clearly, I'm having a gag here. And it's funny. And I get to defend Bruce Lee, my hero. So this is the chilling part. Maybe two hours later, Chael Sonnen texts me. And this is where the genius is. It is in the selection of the medium. Because if he just wrote this in a tweet back, we would be like, oh, this is happening in public, therefore it's funny, therefore it's gamesmanship, therefore this is part of the verbal sparring between people who play in arenas of this nature. But he just texted it to me. A little bit of pleasantries directed towards my life and my wife. Uh, you know, we have a little new home, something about that. A little hello to, to Erica. And then simply <laughs> the address of the hotel that he is at in New York and an invitation to come down and slap him. And you're, I'm looking at this. Now, there's a number of things at play. At first, I'm like, oh, ha, ha, Chael's funny. And then I'm like, well, fuck. This is what it is when someone's in your head. I'm like, okay, well. First of all, did I offend it? My first thought is, am I in any physical danger? My quick answer to that is no. Chael's a businessman, uh, and he doesn't fight to not get paid and he doesn't get arrested for stupid things so I'm not in any physical danger the second would be so that's good the next is oh he's just kidding around but this is what it is to have someone in your head because you could easily go well of course he was kidding around or no he wasn't you've offended. you don't know and I don't know and that's how he wanted it <laughs> that's how he wanted it he wanted to ride in your head to to, to take up that real estate then I had to really give it some thought. It's like, well, did he know I was kidding? Yes. Okay, he did know. So for sure, he knows I'm kidding. He knows me. He knows this is not my arena. He knows I'm joking. So that's good. So what else could be going on here? And then I realize he could be, I'm a subordinate in our relationship and in where we are in our, what we, what we do. I am a subordinate. He is a mentor. I am a mentoree. I'm a learner. I'm developing with his assistance. He's gone out of his way to help me with things. Maybe in this level of our relationship, also knowing that I'm a white belt in this sort of thing, and he is a fucking black belt of black belts, maybe I'm actually out of line. Maybe, and I don't know the rules. That's the thing. I, and to some degree, the rules are made up. You don't know the rules when you're dealing with Conor McGregor because he made them up, right? So I'm like, maybe I'm not allowed to mention to go after his town. He loves that fucking town. Or maybe subordinates don't publicly say they're going to go slap you. But whatever the fuck it is, Chael, by sending that text, polite ple pleasantries towards myself and my wife, and then his address, which I will not read to you because in case he stays at that hotel, he doesn't want you coming to his hotel. Uh, the address to the hotel and an invitation to go and attempt if I chose to slap his face. I don't know what, you were, what your game was, sir, 
but much respect. If I was out of line, sincerest of apologies. And if you're fucking with me, congratulations. You, sir, are the best at it. <laughs> so I just wanted to share that story with you guys. Um, other than that, we are here in Calgary. It has been a beautiful and fun thing. A couple quick things to give you an insight into how what this is like these days. You know, I, I, if you are just watching this segment, you maybe didn't see I told the story about, or listening to the segment, told the story about Chael Sonnen, the ultimate influencer. The game of doing a job like this today is, is the, they call it an influencer job. That's what they call it. And you must have your employers and you must give them fucking a hundred percent of your effort. So I am employed by TSN and I've, we came in to do that. I also, in my free time, I have my own show down the street. We're putting on. We're doing YouTube, Stitcher, iTunes, uh, what's it? SoundCloud. <laughs> Sorry, SoundCloud. Uh, like that's a person. I've offended SoundCloud. Um, Mark is editing stuff. We're shooting things. We're doing one minute breakdowns. This is the job now, but it's it's challenging, man. It's challenging. We were up at a five ish. We're at the airport at seven. We flew f at from eight thirty. Four hours, we gained a few hours. We were going to go directly into the TSN gig. I had to, so I was picked up by a guy named Chad Ferguson. Who, and and for those of you who do podcasts or any of these types of things, you want to see how to get it done? Chad Ferguson, I want to know. Is that the name of his podcast? I want to know. Go check it out. I, I was on it. He didn't say, Hey, could you come on my podcast in Airdrie, you know, 40 minutes outside of Calgary? He said, Can I pick you up at the airport? help you through whatever you're doing that day. And then if you have time, do a podcast and then take you where you need to go. If you, any of you have podcasts or things like that, that's how it's done. That is how it's done. Also, Chad's a very cool guy. So Chad picks us up at the airport, knowing first we were gonna go to his thing, but now with you know my employer becoming busier and busier and they're the number one priority when there's somebody who hires you for your skills and, and effort. We are going to, I'm going to the media day. I will walk in there and be working immediately. I'm in the back of his cab truck getting a suit on and undershirt and a shirt and jacket. Mark's holding that stuff. It's in a suit bag with four other suits. It's nearly impossible. You get that done, put a little makeup, walk straight in, interviewed Alvarez Poirier, Joanna, I think Olivier, Aubin Mercier, Jeremy Stevens, etc. Then shot a couple of pieces for Sports Center, including a double ender. Then we got in his truck. Then we went straight to his place where we did a podcast. I want to know. It's, he, they're doing a great job. A young podcast. Try to follow them if you can. Then he drove us to the UFC gym where I shot an analysis piece that we had been previously working on the Viz with the people back in Toronto. Shot with two great shooters here. They sent that back to, to then send. Then we came back here, cleaned up. Then we've we got to do some stuff related to the show. And then we went and got together with Bisping and Dominic Cruz, which if you're listening to this as a, the full podcast or watching it as the long form, we will be throwing to shortly. That was just yesterday. It was 17 or 18 hours by the time we were done. Did two one-minute breakdowns, one with Dom, one with um, Mike there on the Instagram. This is the job now. This is the job. The job once was... And actually, it was Chael who told me this. When he was working for, for Fox, he would get picked up at West Lynn, Oregon. In a, and he said he would literally just have like his phone in his pocket. He didn't even need money. You would get picked up because he was at the top of the game working for, say, UFC Tonight. Get picked up at his place in West Lynn, Oregon in a in limousine and driven to the airport. You'd get off the thing and a guy would more or less take you by the hand to the other limousine to take you into makeup where people had suits pressed for you. Then they would ask you what you wanted to eat, which was anything you would choose. They'd get that for you. They'd put you in. They'd put you in front of a thing. You'd shoot, and then they'd send you home. It's not like that no more. This is a, and I'm not complaining. This is, we love this. It's a challenging grind, but that's part of the adventure of it. Um, that was just yesterday. And then tonight we're doing the show. Um, I don't know how long we're going, Mark, because I know I'm, I'm meandering all over. The, the mic and Cruz we're going to be throwing to in just a bit. I want to give you, I'm not complaining, and if I sound like I am, please forgive me and correct me. Don't be afraid to correct me. Tell me I sound like I'm being a whiner because I, there's nothing to whine about. This is, this is a thrill. But uh, this morning was the official weigh-ins, and 
w- whenever you're watching or listening to this, the Calgary fights have already happened, right? Um, and hey, you might be listening to this on the Saturday afternoon of the Calgary fights, but a lot of people will listen after. So I want to give you some insights that I gathered from some coaches. So I don't give away anyone's game plan if they don't you know, do it on, you know, live on camera or directly to a camera. And the reason I, I also don't give away any analysis on fighters um, to other camps ever. I was offered good money to break down one of the greatest fighters of all time for a fight, just recently. And I really wanted to do it just for the, ch- the incredible challenge of being a part of it. But I realized, and it was for us, Sahabi who told me this, um, gave me this advice, and he's correct. I am one of the greatest gifts I have in my life, not just job, but my life, is I get invited into all these gyms with all these geniuses, you know? Um, Duke and Mark Henry and, and Faraz and the, all of them, they, they're so kind to me. And I, they see me as a, a pod, I'm generally quite positive and I celebrate these athletes. And so they invite me to their gyms. If I start analyzing fighters and giving them to other teams, that will stop. So I can't do that. So I had to turn that job down. And it would have been pretty cool to do. But I know it's not the right thing to do. Um, but these, so I would never give away something. And they do tell me sometimes. And sometimes I go, that's off the record. And other times I take the genuine compliment of knowing that they know that. That they know that about me from getting to know me over the years. So I won't give those things away. But after the fight, these are things that they will be mentioning and they will be giving away. And... I'm not giving you anything so in detail like, you know, he throws his right hook on a wide angle knowing the head slips over here, which Mark coincidentally told me about Frankie, his head position. I did a breakdown on Frankie knocking out an overhand right. Oh, um, uh, Chad Mendez, who looked fucking good the other day, eh? Holy shit, Chad Mendez, wow. Yeah. Um, so when Frankie landed the right hand left hook on Chad Mendez, Mark saw the the uh, thing and he was started texting me and he was like, you know, bro, he was very complimentary. Um, and I remember describing something that Frankie did was smooth like a model in an evening dress or something. And and Mark was like, I just love your stuff. He's like, I know some people think the, the words you use are crazy. He goes, but for people like us, we love it. And that's a big compliment. But he told me specifically then that that angle that I detected of where, of where Frankie's head was, not just that was right, which is nice, but how hard it is to develop. How hard you have to specifically see something that you might be able to use or that you believe may work. Then you have to train it for weeks or months or years to develop the ability to do it. You can't just tell a fighter, oh, I want you to put your head on this different line when you throw a punch against fucking Demetrius Johnson. Uh, you, well, great. Okay, coach. And then the way you've done it for the last 10 years, as soon as you get hit a few times and get a little tired, that's how you'll do it. You have to retrain. You have to form the, the, the neurological pathways in your brain to do it. Uh, so that stuff is cool. So anyways, the, the few things that they mentioned to me will be relevant after the fight because we'll be able to look back and go, oh, was that so? And I'm finding this idea a hell of a lot more interesting than the idea of who you got. And no offense to anyone who, who likes that or likes to gamble or anything or people are like who you got in this one. I'd like to see people write down some things that could happen and then open it later. Don't, you don't have to tell me now what you think. And also, I know that there's no way to really predict these things. But if you've made a little envelope and stuck it in there, and then after it's like, by the way, bitches, I said that DC would land a head kick or John Jones would land a head kick on Cormier. You'd be like, well, what? I remember one, um, I, te- I um, had texted Sean Shelby because I was working w- with a guy named Nick Denis, and we were um, – we were, Sean signed him and we, we were booking fights. And I said, Cub is going to knock out Ross Pearson with a left hook in the second round. That was back when I believed you could predict those things. And you make enough of them, one is going to be right. And that one was right. Um, and uh, Sean was like, holy shit. And it's like, that is very impressive. But you don't talk about the other 83 times. You're like, oh, yeah, I think it's going to be a head kick. Joe, for, uh, Jeremy Stevens flying knee on, on, you know, Jose Aldo. Or I think that one's going to end due to eye poke. You know what I mean? It's like predicting a punch is about as logical as predicting a groin shot. Like, it's just as barely predictable, right? But, but um, 
So anyways, when we look at this one, uh, Mark Henry gave me some interesting insight and stuff he said before, and, and he would be careful. And this isn't something I can't, can't repeat. Um, I'm sure of it, so, which is why I'm telling you. But he's like, if, if we got full MMA, Eddie, we're going to win this fight. If we got wing and punches just going in there to fucking experience it and let it fly, Eddie, we might win this fight. And sometimes that's a really interesting and simple way to look at it. It's like, well, what's the game plan, coach? Well, this game, any of the, you're a fucking high-level professional fighter. Any of these may work. But this one's going to work most likely. You know what I mean? And in Eddie's case, the way that he beat Gilbert Melendez, and please do me a favor, don't forget how fucking good Gilbert Melendez is. Easy to do when we forget time passes, but that was a, is a great fighter. And then uh, Anthony Pettis. The way he beat those two guys can beat a lot of guys like that. And that doesn't mean you don't pepper in big shots and you don't take them down and elbow them, but you can squeeze these guys, wear them down, make them less dangerous, and you got 25 minutes to do it. So... From what I'm picking up, that's what they'd like Eddie to do. That's how they'd like Eddie to fight. The interesting p thing for me when we look at this after the fight is, did he do it? And, uh, cause, and if he did, were they right? And it worked and it was the key to it. The first one, if the answer is no, he didn't do it, this whole conversation becomes irrelevant. But if the answer is, yeah, he put him against the fence and he wore him down and he, it was the difference. He won rounds four and five and won the fight or he was wearing him down and it was working. But Dustin reversed him, hurt him, was on top of him or submitted him or something. So this to me, knowing the intention is really interesting to me. What what is your what is the coach's intention for Eddie Alvarez? Uh, it doesn't mean Eddie gives a shit. In fact, Eddie loves his Coaches, teams, teammates, like those guys are t quite tight, that, that group. And I know you could say this about any of them, but they have like, uh, there's a religious connection between most of these men, you know what I mean? And, and women and uh, family connection. And that's something you can hear a lot, but I see it on a, in a different way with these guys. Uh, so he loves them and he would like to give them what they want, but sometimes he just goes in and trusts his process and his process involves suffering. He told me that too. He's told me that. He said... I know if I'm suffering in a fight that I'm ultimately going to be winning. And I need and if I'm suffering, I need to treat the process. And I was like, that's fucked up, but amazing, right? That's the kind of shit. That's the kind of shit that really excites me about our job being here is, you know, face to face looking the best in the world in the eye who we share conversation and got somebody like Eddie has respect for for what I bring to the table and what I how I look at things and he'll share an idea like that with me that if he's in a fight and he's suffering and he's experiencing suffering that means you probably are too and if that's and so then he needs to trust the process cuz that means if we're both suffering I can suffer longer and harder and better and come out the other side and beat you. Right? That's awesome. So super jazzed for that fight. And 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 I don't want to find myself in a place where, because it's just not my nature, where I'm only looking at it from one side. I'm a huge Dustin Poirier fan. Huge. Massive. Like I have been for a long time. Uh, I remember in Quebec going up and only talking to him after a show in Quebec uh, because I was desperately curious about what he was doing and why he was doing it. And I've been following him very closely ever since. But Eddie is one of my very favorite. And so it's, I'm human, you know. Um, what else did we learn? A um, couple other quick things. Um, spend a little bit of time with Duke Rufus today and... Uh, and man, that guy loves martial arts. Man, does he does he love martial arts, you know? And the history of it and, and his connection to it through long pants kickboxing and then through Muay Thai and then through his um, his love of, of, you know, the boxing concepts of Cuba and pulling in, he's a purple belt and pulling in all the different martial arts. And you can see how much he loves working with John McDessie. And I bring it up because very easy if somebody said, hey, who's one of the most special fighters that you know that most people don't quite understand or connect to or realize how? And the answer would be John McDessie for me. 
um, very, very, very special and, and different martial artist. And Duke um, encourages him. Once upon a time, they said, you know, you can't cross your feet when you do an armbar. And they said a front kick will never work in fighting. And, and Anderson Silva and Leo, Leo Machida. And then they said a spinning hook kick will never work in fighting. People said once head kicks didn't work. Boss Rutten, one of the greatest of all time uh, and, you know, greatest of his era and greatest coaches that directed and grew into what Dwayne Ludwig does and a massively influential, awesome, wonderful human being. He once said don't jab in fighting because that's where it was at at the time. Well, there's a lot of things they say now. That won't work. You shouldn't do that. Well, John does those things. And Duke encourages him to do those things. And that's where the gold is. All the things they say that are wrong or incorrect, that's where the gold is. And that's true in martial arts, and that's true in life. Um, let's take a minute here, and I'm going to um, pass... The, your listening pleasure or viewing pleasure now over to Dominic Cruz and Michael Bisping. Uh, Bisping is a hilarious and wonderful human being. He uh, was a world champion, and we love him. And uh, he's also become, you know, brilliant at, uh, at sharing the ideas on television, both as a character and as an analyst. And Dominic Cruz is one of the greatest fighters in the lighter weight divisions ever, and he has also become a brilliant analyst. And so uh, it's super cool to be able to share this stuff that Mark caught with you guys. And um, right after this, we will be back and uh, take a look at a uh, quick look at TJ Dillashaw versus Cody Garbrandt 2. All right, stand by. Well, Mike, let's talk, talk about the main event. I mean, obviously, we know that the least you guys did it before, and uh, you know we know how it ended. I guess first, can you talk about the ending? And what was your take watching that fight the first time or replaying it? I mean, illegal knees should have been disqualification. I mean, guess I knew what you. I mean, heaven forbid. I mean, I would never knee somebody when they're down. Okay, <laughs> let's just get that out there right away. Um, speaking from experience, when you're in the heat of the moment, you know, I don't think Eddie Alvarez. Of course, he, was it the second round? Yeah, it was the second round he got rocked and it looked like he was, you know, potentially going to be finished. He managed to turn it around, much like Eddie Alvarez always does. He's very, very tough. Um, I don't think he intentionally meant to, you know, for the fight to end like that. But when you're in the thick of it like that, you know, when you're in a fist fight or an MMA fight and shit's flying everywhere, you know, you're just fighting on instinct a lot of the time. So it was unfortunate. It really was. It was an amazing fight. Of course, we get to see it again Saturday night. I'm looking forward to it. Um, I don't know. I... Well, Eddie comes out and he says he, he wanted the easy way out. I mean, do you see anything in Dustin that makes you think? Oh, I mean, that's a tricky one. You know, I mean, it seemed to me like Dustin was winning that fight, if you ask me. You know, yes, towards the end, uh, Eddie uh, was in the driver's seat. But for the most part, I would have said Dustin uh, was tr controlling that fight. Eddie did say this week it's because he was, it was his first fight since the Connor fight, is that correct? So maybe that was, you know, giving him some internal demons. Uh, and that can happen, you know, in the fight game, you, you take a tough loss, the next time you go in there, you carry that with you. So, so maybe, m maybe that was a factor, or maybe that's just Eddie saying something that sounds good, because it does sound good. It's a nice little insurance policy, you know? So uh, I guess we'll find out Saturday night. I want to ask you about like Dustin, you know, a fighter's mindset, right? Throughout his career, we've seen Dustin seems to not fight well when he's his most emotional, right? And this yeah. is like this rematch with all this stuff that's on the line. So as a fighter, I mean, how do you go in there and knowing he's probably pissed off, he's probably pissed off in the first fight, he's probably pissed off at Eddie saying that he was basically ducking out of the fight. Like, how do you control yourself and control your emotions to make sure that emotion doesn't get the best of you? Well, emotions uh, can be your best friend and your worst enemy in a fight. I learned that the hard way. It took me towards the end of my career to control that. At the start, I used to try and get emotional. Of course, that's not the way to be. When you're in a frantic state of mind, you're never the best version of yourself, whether you're a reporter, um, a TV producer, a barman, or a fighter. If you're, if you're angry, you're emotional, you know, you're not the best version of yourself. So... I, he, he's experienced, you know, he knows what's on the line. If he beats Eddie, he's got to be in line for a title shot pretty soon. Of course, it's a complicated uh, scenario at the moment, but he's got to be at the top of the food chain, so to speak. Um, so, yeah, I don't think we're going to see anything silly. I don't think he's going to go in there angry. He's experienced, he's been there before. How much do you think Eddie's uh, championship experience, you know, just even outside the UFC when he's a title holder there, will, will play a factor in this fight? Dustin's been in five round the fence, but. Eddie's been in the championship. Yeah, Eddie said that this week. He said he was an undercard fighter. I don't think that's necessarily true. Um, 
And as I said, listen, I respect Eddie Alves. I'm a, I'm a fan of Eddie Alves and of Dustin Poirier, but uh, didn't look like that fight was going to get out of the second round. So three rounds, five rounds, it doesn't really matter. So do you have a pick or you know? I, I'll make that at the, uh, the FS1 pre-fight show, guys. You know, you'll have to tune in. I know you'll all be on the edge of your seats until then. Where, where, where's Bisping going to go? But, uh, yeah, no. I, I, and not just that. I don't want to put that out there that this early in fight week. It's, it's bad karma for someone to hear that. Not that they give a fuck what I say. <laughs> Let's just get that out there. What do you think about these two guys? I mean, they basically both came in and said, hey, we're fighting for a number one contender spot. Yep. You know, so they knew it was in line. And then this morning we hear, oh, Connor's, Connor's good, he's clear to fight. I mean, Connor's likely going to come in and, and, and sweep away their title shot. How do you think that's affecting those guys mentally? Do you honestly believe that that's a shock? Do you think that they didn't believe that Connor was always going to walk into that title fight? I think everybody knew that. Uh, they're just cementing themselves as the next guy. But I think, unfortunately, they're probably going to end up fighting again. I would have assumed, unless they want to sit on the sidelines for six months, eight months, even a year. Who knows? So they'll probably fight again. Uh, but they'll just be... You know, at the front of the crowd, so to speak. I think they know that. You know, Conor McGregor, huge star, massive draw, all the rest of it. He was the champ, he got stripped. So really, by rights, Conor, you know, I mean, I, I'm not a cheerleader of Conor McGregor. I'm not a hater, far from it, but I'm not, what, you know, I'm not, I'm not the biggest fan. I'm not the, the worst fan. That makes it sounding bad. Um, but I'm not just going to say Conor deserves it, but he does. He does deserve it. He was the champ, you know, so he deserves it. What about the co-main event, uh, Jose Aldo? A lot of questions heading into this fight. Uh, do you, you know, some people say he's lost a step. Others say he just fought Max Holloway twice. It's pretty easy to say that. Yeah. What's, what's your philosophy on that with him heading into this fight? Yeah, it's a tricky one. When you look at it from the offset, you think, wow, uh, he's lost three out of his last four. Mm -hmm. But realistically, when you break it down, it's only to two opponents. Mm -hmm. Conor McGregor, of course, and then the Max Holloway. Two fights. But they were tough fights, they were nasty beatings, you know, it wasn't just a case it got caught in an arm bar or got caught with a right hook or something like that. It was, you know, it was a systematic beatdown from start to finish and Max proved to be the better fighter on two occasions. Now, how's Jose going to deal with that? You know, that's always the big question. Um, I guess we'll see Saturday night. I think he said this week that he's, he re realises the end's coming, which, which is, you know, it comes to everybody at some point and I think he realises that. But um, if you look at him after the Conor fight against Frank Diego, he still looked as good as he's ever have done. Has done, have done, has done. Um, and Holloway's a great fighter. Holloway's amazing. He really is. So I guess we'll see. I mean, he's a far more technical fighter than what Jeremy Stevens is. You know, but they always say, brawler boxer and boxer brawler. So they've both got the perfect styles for one another. It's who can implement it the best. On the other side, um, your broadcast colleague, Daniel Cormier, uh, he got you. He just became the champ champ. Yes. Um, everybody's talking about, you know, who's the best fighter ever. You got Cormier, you got that. Anderson Silva, you defeated, I should have. Uh, George St. Pierre, uh, John Jones, all these names come yeah. up. The one name that seems to be left out of the equation is Jose Aldo, a man who. Sure. Uh, this is yeah. his first non title fight since uh, June of 2009. So, it's I mean, crazy. Yeah, so, wow. And his first three round fight in like over a decade. So it's, uh, it's pretty crazy um, what he's done, but nobody seems to give him that kind of respect. Why do you think that is? You know, that's an incredible point, the fact that you just mentioned that. First non-title fight in how long? Since uh, 09, June. Yeah, yeah that, I mean, that's incredible. That's incredible. So he's been fighting the best of the best. So you're right. I mean, he should be in those conversations for sure. Uh, I, I think, I mean, he's got to be in the top five though, right? On the pound for pound list. He's got to be up there. I don't know what it is off the top of my head, but he certainly deserves to be in those conversations. I just think uh, perhaps that 13-second loss to uh, Connor Hurt, obviously, and then... He lost his last two as well. When you lose three out of your last four, it just kind of, you know, obviously MMA fans are fickle. MMA journalists are fickle, you know, mm -hmm. you fucking assholes. <laughs> so, uh, no, do you know what I mean? When you lose three of your last four, then of course, once upon a time, he maybe was the pound for pound, but as of right now, we live in the present, he's probably well, not. I'm talking all time. Like oh, all about right, about okay, shit. change the question, okay. Um, <laughs> yeah, of all time, yeah, maybe, May maybe for sure, of course. Uh, Anderson, GSP, Demetrius Johnson, Jose Aldo, uh, Anderson, you know, they, they, they all deserve to be in those conversations. And uh, on the other side of the coin, on the coming event, we have Jeremy Stevens. He is 29th UFC fight, tying your record. And yeah. As relevant as ever, I mean. How many I mean, wins? 
Uh, <laughs> not as many. <laughs> not, as many <laughs> not as many as you. Let's just get that out there. Yeah, there you go. Uh, but you have this guy, I mean, he's arguably at his best. Yeah. Player. If you look at the list of guys who have 25 or more UFC fights, he's the only guy that's like a relevant title contender at this point. He's been doing this. No, for sure. It's, it's, like, it's, it's, how, it's, um, how do you maintain that, like that deep into your UFC career? Yeah, yeah. No, no. He's certainly in the best form of his career. He's beating the best guys and he's doing it super impressively and in violent fashion. You know, he always brings it every time. Jeremy Stevens is must see TV for my, for my money. Uh, how's he doing it? I don't know. You know, I mean, he's got a good team, Team Alliance. You know, they've got a great set of coaches, great training partners, all that good stuff. I mean, it's just it's just the way it comes. You know, fighting as much as it is physical is a thinking man sport. It really is. So maybe he's understanding the game a little more. You know, maybe he was a little reckless. Maybe he was a little immature in terms of a fighter's mindset when he was younger. Now he seems to be, you know, a little more calculated. Still got that aggressive style that he's known and loved for. Uh, but it seems to be a little more calculated in what he's doing. I'm sure with, with guys like Dominic Cruz, I'm sure that's helping. I mean, you mentioned that uh, you, know, you have the most wins in UFC history. He has the most losses in UFC oh. history. And, you know, he's obviously, to go through that, and obviously, yeah, yeah. he's always praised you for, like, your perseverance and ability to overcome tough moments. Yeah. It seems like he's... Yeah, but I mean, Jerry's, Jeremy is as tough as they come. He really is, and I mean that's that, that that's an impressive stat in its own, in its own right. You know, in, in a weird way because I mean, I always I'm always impressed by fighters when I see them. You know, like you see some of these fighters. I was looking at someone's record recently, and I think he'd lost his last nine in a row or something like that. And you think it was on the contender. I was researching. I was researching some of their opponents to see the quality of the opposition they'd beat, and one guy had lost like. I think it was more, I think it was like 12, 13 in a row. I was like, holy shit. How do you still get back in there? After you, knowing you're probably gonna lose again and again and again. And there's multiple ways of answering that. One, maybe they don't have many options. Secondly, it's because they love it. Thirdly, they, they, they know they can do better. I always knew I could do better. And Jeremy obviously always had the talent and the skill. Uh, and now he's putting it all together. You know, at this age of his career, it's beautiful to see. I was, I was talking to Ross Pearson and he, he spoke about how you know, he's had his head cracked open, he's had his teeth knocked out. Yeah. And he was talking about this card and sort of saying that there's a lot of guys on this card who I have. he just sees as being fighters. And these old school guys who are just fighters. When you look at this card, do you see that? Because, I mean, you look at Poirier, you look at Alvarez. There's a lot of guys who have just, they've been grinding for a long time. I mean, what, yeah. What, does that add to respect for a guy when they just hung around and just fought? Yeah, no, of course he does. I mean, it's nice to get in win the title straight away and get out with a ton of money I mean that's great but also you know some people you know you're born a fighter in my opinion I mean you can mould people a certain way and you know I mean guys some guys they just love it and even if they had all the money in the world they'd still do it you know and some of the people on this card they're cut from that cloth Dominic's going to give you way better answers if you've got anything to hear. Yeah. Well, Tom, now you here, I, I want to ask you, there's, there's some interesting similarities, right, between Jose Aldo, Yuani, and Jacek, two former champions that, you know, kind of didn't lose a lot. It, it, it's this question marks about it, like, did they drop off or are they still relevant? But I want to ask you, I mean, as a champion, as, as a person that's been a champion, I mean, how, do, how, how do you get that out of your mindset? You know, that, yes, I lost, but I'm still world class. I'm still championship level. I mean, is does self-doubt creep in? Do you wonder, like, oh my gosh, have I have I fallen off the edge? I wonder how, how both Aldo and Yuana should, should approach this fight. Well, I'm in a similar scenario. So what's the difference with me and them? Mm. There really isn't any. Um, the, the, what makes the fighters the best in the world, in my opinion, is losing and being able to come back and get a streak going. Just like looking at champions when they win a belt and then they don't defend it, to me, they're not a champion until you defend it. I look at fighters like you're not a real true belt fighter until you lose and work your way back and figure out a way to, to get back to winning. Bisping did it, Ross Pearson's doing it, Jeremy Stevens did it, he's back at the top. The list goes on, people who lose, who can come back. That is the true marker for me as to what a fighter is because really all fighting is is resilience because it's a matter of time before we all lose. Uh, we can't do this forever unless you pick your fights the way Mayweather, Mayweather did. So self doubt creep. I mean, when you've been to the mountaintop and you've been at the highest level, and then somebody beats you. I mean, at that point, are you so like confident in yourself, like you know, hey, I just need to tweak this and need to tweak that, or is there a part of you goes, oh, maybe I'm not that good? Now I was gonna say, if if you think that, then your career is over. As soon as you start thinking I'm not that good and this and that, and I'm just here for a paycheck, yeah, I'm probably gonna lose this fight, but I'm still gonna do it. 
you know, it's over. It's over. Fighters don't think like that. You know, every time I stepped in there, I always believed I was going to win the fight. 100%. And even though I had people writing me off throughout my career saying, oh, he's done, he's over, he's got one fucking eye, it's done. I, 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 I never accepted that. I never believed that, you know. And that's what you, the way you have to be. Almost pig-headed, arrogant, whatever you want to call it. You know, as soon as that doubt creeps in, find a new job. For me, you also can't deny what lost you the fight. So there's a fine line you got to ride. Um, you can be like, I would say 95% of fighters and say, oh, this happened, my toe hurt, uh, my weight cut was bad, uh, this and that, this and that. I didn't walk across the street with my left foot forward instead of my right. I could go on for days if yeah. you listen to 98, I'd say 98% of fighters have an excuse to fall back on. The truth is, you lost. The judges didn't pick it in your favor or you got knocked out or finished. So how are you going to make up this ground to fix the things that happen to you? Because while you're not a loser because you lost, you're not, Aldo is no less than he ever was. Young Jacek is no less than what she ever was. The competition is, however, growing. The sport is, however, evolving. And as athletes, as champions, and as guys who had put together a big streak and then maybe lose one or two, you've got to understand that the sport's evolving. And, the more wins you get in this sport, the more adaptations the division is making to you. And then, the more that you're sharing what you're doing in the sport to be successful, the more you're building your division, now you're giving back to the sport, now you're giving back to the division, and from there, the sport grows. So technically, if you're doing your job, if you stay on top, you defend your titles, you lose and you come back, you're building the division, which means you're building the sport, which means that's what the whole point of this thing is. So losing is just part of it, you gotta accept it. And you guys, you between the two of you, the majority of your most relevant fights have been five rounders, and you have people like Aldo and Joanna, they spent the majority of their most recent career doing five round fights, and now they're going to three rounds. Does that change things, you know, strategy wise, your ability to not have to pace yourself over five rounds, <coughs> maybe you can go harder, change your output, those kind of things? Is that like a, it, is that something real? It changes it in the training camp. On the night when you're fighting, of course, the dangers are still as real, whether it's one round, three rounds, or five rounds. You still get knocked out, still get finished, still lose rounds. Um, changes it in the training camp, changes it with your diet, recovery, all that type of stuff. Workload in the training camp, the amount of sparring that you do. I mean, three rounds, I mean, I can't remember the last time I did a three rounder, but I remember thinking, shit, this is great. Because it's almost half the work. And of course, if you're gonna spar five rounds, you're gonna train five, sorry, if you're gonna fight five rounds, you're gonna spar five rounds. And if you do that three times a week, two times a week, whatever it is, the workload is almost doubled. Um, on the night, as I say, the dangers are still the same. And yeah, you, you can certainly um, have a different game plan. It all depends on the fighter. Some people like to think like that. Some people go for the knockout from round one. It, and it all depends on your opponent. You know, if the guy is a slow starter, then maybe you'll start fast. You know, if the guy's notoriously, you know, it all depends on the opponent. So it's hard to answer that question. Alex Hernandez, who's obviously a confident young guy, he's, he's very young, he's 25, and what he said was his starting point for MMA was watching you know you guys and being like, hey, that was possible and they had to push past it. And he just said that this next generation that's coming up is going to be just just absolutely you know on, on another level. Do you believe that? Do you, do you just think that it's... That's what we're hoping for. I'm not here to tell him he's not going to be better than the generation before, and if he's not, then what are you doing? So that's what this thing was about. That's what Bisping fought for. That's why I fought. That's why I fight to bring the level up. So good, Hernandez. Let's see you. Who's let's, Hernandez? Let's see you get up. Let's he's see you. <laughs> no, I'm not. I don't know who he is. Do I I'm like, serious. I'm not joking. No, he's the first guy in the main fight. Oh, that guy. Sorry, <laughs> pardon me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, I know who he is. I'm kidding. I'm just joshing. <laughs> no, the, the truth is, I've though, my whole he's, guys. he's in the right mind frame. Fucking, you know, I said, this, I said the same thing. When I started wow. this thing, I said, I'm going to be better than the people before me, the people that Can't were wait. winning. I mean, that's the way you're supposed to think. I have no I have no problem with him thinking that. I hope he keeps it. As, what's, what's the key for, for you know, guys who are still competing? You look at these guys and you're like, okay, well, they've been training since they were five. Yeah, but I know more than them. <laughs> so <laughs> they, can, they can have the youth, they can have the speed and the power and the, you know, have all the, all the girth and the want in the world, but I've been there, I've wanted it, and I've completed it, and I know a system to do it again. And I also have the tools that you can't take away that I've learned over the years. So regardless, up and coming, young, not, you just gotta adapt and keep moving forward. I mean, what's Bisping, 130 years old? He's still here, you know? Look fucking good, though. <laughs> um, 
the sport is always evolving, you know, and, and we're learning new ways to train and new techniques, new methods, etc. And that's great, you know, and, and the future generations will be better than the generations today. I mean, if you look at boxing, you look at all sports, right. world records are always getting broken and that'll continue to happen. And the skill level will increase, yeah. athletic ability will increase and that's great. And I look forward to watching it, but you can't buy or train for experience. John, when you, uh, when you fight, Hot you lava. <laughs> Hot lava. Hot lava. Yeah, I like it. Sorry. Uh, when you fight, do you want to hit and not get hit? That's that's martial arts. You have to hit. You see, right. you see Alvarez, and he talks about how when he's suffering in a fight, he knows to trust the process because that means he's going to win. When you, what part of you admires that, or what part of you thinks that is crazy? Well, to me, that's a five-round mentality, and that's what Alvarez fights with. He fights with a five-round mentality, and. To go back on that question, three rounds to five rounds, it's double the workload when you do five rounds, it's less than that. But that also takes away your margin for error in three rounds. Now I don't have that 10 minutes of cushion that what happens if I lose the first round, I lose, was just gonna say. lose the third, I kill him in the second, now I have fourth and fifth to get to, to win the fight still. So there's, there's things you gotta think about and that's how Eddie Alvarez thinks. That's always how he's thought. He says, you know what, if I'm hurting, I know for a fact this guy's hurting as bad, if not more than me. And nine times out of ten, he's right. Uh, the only time he hasn't been right was Conor McGregor, and that was because he he just got hit first. And um, Conor's the type of guy that will always benefit in a three-round fight. Why? He has the gift of power, and that's okay. Some people have that gift, some people don't. Some people have the gift of maybe I don't have power, but I'm going to grind you out until your power is literally nothing, mm -hmm. and then I'm going to choke you in the fifth round. So. Everybody's got their gifts and the key to this thing is understanding yourself what your gift is and not wanting to be somebody else Being who you are and adapting your gifts to each fight accordingly for three rounds five rounds each opponent as it may be and, um, I asked the uh, same question to Mike about Jeremy Stevens before you arrived, but you're obviously you know, very close with him and being around um, You look at all the fighters in the UFC with 25 or more UFC fights. He's pretty much the only relevant title picture type of guy right now how is he being able to do this this deep in his career? I mean, he has the most losses in UFC history on his record, um, but he's as relevant as ever at this point. How, being personal up front with him, how is he being able to do this and you know, put this together at this stage in his career, so many hours in the octagon, so many years in the score? Jeremy's an example of a fighter who had all the tools his entire career and just couldn't quite gather himself outside of the octagon. And that's, there's a lot of fighters this way that could be and should be maybe multiple time world champions, John Jones, and can't keep the life together outside of the octagon at times. And it takes away from what they can be and what they are. Uh, I wouldn't say that it did that necessarily all the time for Jeremy, but that explains the win one, lose one, win one, lose one mentality that he has, that he's had in the past. Well, his, you know, he's adapted to it. He's, he's, he's let go, he's more focused. The, the time has taken over, he's more calm. His brain, he's matured. It's just maturity, guys. It's all it is. You, sometimes it takes longer from a, well, for some than you. others. And I don't train again. It's just, it's just, just maturity. Smart. But you can see it in his face, guys. I mean, look at him when he, in his interviews. Look at him. Everything is different. Go, I encourage you, go back and watch interviews from three, four years ago and watch Jeremy's uh, interviews now. He's got a team behind him that he feels backing and confidence that aren't trying to take from his career for themselves. He's got a team around him that wants to see Jeremy do great because we want to see Jeremy do great. Not, we want to see Jeremy do great so that I can say, hey, I coached him and I'm a really good coach and I hope Pat's better than everybody. Which is the majority of five sports. And you know, the corners, you, they love it. They want to talk so much in the corner because they want to be heard on the camera or they're, they're all competing. I'm not talking about my team recently, but I've had it in the past. They're, they all want to be the one walking out with you. And so you'll see it. Seen, and you, you got to spot it's those ridiculous. guys in this sport. And Jeremy's been through this for so long. He's spotted those guys, gone through them. And now he's with the team that he trusts. And you know what? Who knows? Maybe in a year from now, we won't be that team anymore. But that's okay. We'll release him and we'll let him do what he needs to for his own career. Because we have nothing to gain from him except watching him succeed. And that type of mindset is what's helped Jeremy because he's got support. Real support and real coaching. So, Tom, we, uh, I spoke to Algerine Sterling a couple weeks ago about the band like title picture. And he mentioned he thought the winner of a fight between you and Marlon Moraes would fight for the title. Is that a fight that's going to happen? I don't know. I just got cleared by the doctor, so I'm good <laughs> to go. Um, I'll talk to Shelby. I'll talk to everybody. I'm on track though, so I will be going to fight. I'm going to fight before the end of the year is my goal. So we'll see what we'll see what happens. I 
Aljamain Sterling doesn't know what's going on. I don't know what's going on. I know TJ Dillashaw and Cody are fighting, and I should be having the winner of that. That's what everybody wants to see. So hopefully, you know, somebody gets some wits about him and gives me that fight right away. We'll see what happens. So the lineup on the card in Toronto in December, because they haven't announced any fights yet. That's a big paper. Hey, you want to you want to line up? Let's do it. Sure. You know, get, get him to sign it. I'll, I'll take it. Uh, 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 for the record, John told these guys not to ask you any of those questions. Okay. So don't be mad at him. Okay. Uh, I want to ask about Joanna. Um, we talked about mentally. What about execution and technique-wise? Do you guys see anything in her last two fights that's just as, like any sort of drop-off in her performance at all? Or if she fights like she did in her fight against Rose, which was a pretty close fight, do you think that's enough to get her back on the championship track? I think, to be honest, uh, the last fight she did great. You know, she, she fought well, she fought a smart fight. She's just fighting an opponent who has similar tools to her and is a little bit longer. Um, against Tisha Torres, you know, she's beaten that kind of opponent before. You know, look at, um, it was Andrade, yeah. Jessica Andrade, you know, similar type of game plan. Use the jab, keep her on the end of a jab. I don't see uh, Jan Jacek slipping or anything like that. You know, it's just hard, you know. There's some great female fighters in that division. Rose Nama Yunus was, you know, she's coming into her own, she's coming into a prime, she's getting better and better. Obviously, finishing Joanna the way she did in the first fight gave her a ton of confidence going into the rematch, and vice versa, that gave Jan Jacek a little bit of doubt going into the second fight as well. Um, so, yeah, not if Joanna goes out there and fights the way she normally fights, you know, no disrespect to Tisha, I should say she'll cruise to a pretty decent victory here. Does this say so something about her that she just... Well, no, because she still believes she, that she's the best. It goes back to what I said before. She still believes, I mean, she feels that she won that rematch. You know, obviously she can't bitch about the first one. That was pretty decisive. But the rematch, she feels that she won. She feels that it was a, you know, an iffy decision. It was a somewhat close fight. Um, she feels that she's still the best and she wants to go out there and prove it. You know, at the end of that fight, she wasn't necessarily beat up. There's no better way of getting a, another fight, getting right back in there, beat somebody else. And she feels like she's going to get another title fight after this. I don't think so. I think that's a little too soon, but if still. If Rose loses, maybe. I mean, if Ro oh, yeah, for sure, if Rose loses. Yeah. If Rose loses, maybe. If I win the lottery, I don't have to speak to you people. <laughs> you know? I know you guys got to bounce, but I want to ask you both, like, in your prep for this, is there, is there a name or a fight that you were looking at this card? Because everybody's talking about the main event, the co-main. Was there anything that stuck out to you on the card, top to bottom, that you're like, that's a person to watch, or that's a fight to watch, because it's going to be nuts? I mean, Bisping won't know, but Hernandez versus Alba Mercer <laughs> is honestly going to be a very good fight. It, it really is. I mean, because we haven't seen Hernandez. Uh, I haven't seen the guy in a while, but he's still going to talk some shit. <laughs> Last time I spoke to him, he told me that he loves me. He did. He did. And I mean it. I love all of you, too. Okay? Oh, Jesus who Christ. Who has the bigger upside in this lightweight division? Uh, Olivier or Alex Hernandez? Who has the bigger upside? Yeah. That's what this fight's happening for, man. <laughs> You buy uh, it. <laughs> it is. We're in Canada, so I'm just curious. Olivier, yeah. He's out to a really big. No, his last fight, it looked great. It looked well, good. What, I mean, what I like about the matchup itself is that you got a guy who hasn't been forced to grapple at all. I mean, you look at his stats, he hasn't even had a takedown attempted on him yet. That being said, who's a better matchup than a guy who's going to hang on you like a monkey, you know, and just just try to drown you with his weight? Alba Masser will do that. So we'll see what happens. Now Hernandez gets tested. Can he just walk through him and knock him out like he's been doing everybody else? I don't know. You know, he's tough to, Avi Mercer is tough to get a hold, tough to hit. His striking is improved. He's got power in both hands. But more than anything, Hernandez has just seemed more powerful than everybody. And I don't know if he's going to be more powerful than a giant Avi Mercer. He won his debut, Hernandez. He's ranked 13th. So, Obama Mercer is 6 and 1 at light ranking. He's not ranked. Is that stupid? Uh, Does that the, make any sense? The to you? rankings to me are ridiculous. But <laughs> Ross That's Pearson. another story. Well, That's crazy. right, yeah, of course. You know, I mean, he's had some tough times recently. He got back to winning ways in his last fight. He's been training with you, but Ross is always fun to watch, of course. Known him for a long time, so I'm a little biased. But, uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing Ross do his thing. Mike, just when we asked all personal question, you, you posted that photo on your Instagram the other day. It looked like your eye was much different. Did you get something done? No, it's just, you know, the, the amazing powers <laughs> of recovery. It's incredible what you can do if you put if you put your mind to it. Yeah, CBDMD, man. I started taking that shit and my eye just regenerated. That's fucking sick. That does look a lot better. You start getting punched. I, I might I might come back. Who knows? You know. Do you spar still or not? I haven't been in an MMA gym since November. When when did I get knocked out of Castellan? November something. Yeah, I'm, <laughs> I'm too busy. I've got better things to do. If you're not gonna pay me, what the fuck am I in the gym for? <laughs> 
I'm joking. I'm, no, I'm joking. I'm joking. Uh, yeah, no, I still go down there. I still train. You know, I love to work out. I love martial arts. I've done it my entire life. So, uh, but yeah, no, I'm happy. Bye, guys. Dominic Cruz and Michael Bisping. That was, that was cool. And, you know, after that, we got to hang. If you follow me on Instagram, at Robin Black MMA, I deal a one minute with each of those guys. We're going to try to get Mike to have breakfast with us on Sunday and do a, a one-on-one podcast. We'll see. Um, if you're listening to Fighting is About Fighting 2, we're going to go right into Dillashaw versus Garbrandt. And if you're not, then I'm going to start right now. All right. This, <laughs> how about that? This is a short analysis piece, a first analysis piece on Dillashaw versus Garbrandt too. The week of the fight, we will hope to do another. And when I say hope, man, we are busy and traveling and doing a lot of things. So hopefully we can. Uh, TJ Dillashaw and Cody Garbrandt are two of the very, very best bantamweights ever. Two of the very best fighters ever. And partic- and I'm going to say this, and I mean no disrespect to Cody Garbrandt, former champion, when I say this. I, I mean particularly TJ Dillashaw. Now, what do I mean and why did I say that? And, and sorry, Cody, I, I, give me a chance to not like have this come out the wrong way. When it comes to just technical expression of, con- of fighting concepts, TJ Dillashaw is on a different plane. But, Cody Garbrandt, in what is still evolving and growing, and can beat TJ Dillashaw, he can and might, uh, but he's also the raw materials of what he is, to me, has m- even potentially more potential. What he could become is even more special. Um, and that's frightening because uh, his bantamweight champion, the world. do you see what he did to our guy Dominic Cruz? Do you see, you see what the fuck that guy did to Dominic Cruz? Ain't nobody done that. Nobody. Nobody done that. And uh, he might do that to TJ. He might. You know, the biggest issue with the, the game of, you know, whether we are making prognostications or predictions or even analysis, and the reason I bring this up is because I want to find a cure to this, but I don't have it yet, is that we talk about things as if they are fixed. And whatever we're talking about with these two guys, they are both so much better than every piece of footage that we can see. Now, the only real answer to this, and I don't, the answer to this is to go in and spend time, and sometimes a lot of time, weeks, uh, days for sure, uh, in the gyms and see their, their evolution and see them prepping for fights. Now, that is the answer to the problem of, we can't analyze them because we don't really know what they are. We only know what they were. So that's the answer. But a new problem arises. How the fuck do we make a living doing that? How do we pay for that? How do we facilitate this? So I don't have that answer. I don't have that answer yet. Maybe there is some sponsorship, something in the world that would benefit by us going and doing that. You know? Maybe if we wore Roots of Fight, and I know my friends at Roots of Fight, this they don't have budgets for this, so I'm just using them as an example because I like them, and I like their clothes. And actually, don't tell anybody, don't tell my producer at TSN, but he really wants a Sugar Ray Leonard shirt. They have new cool Sugar Ray Leonard shirts, so Roots of Fight, hook me up with a medium for my guy, okay? Or large, I don't know, maybe large. Um, Mark likes them too. Um, but maybe there's some company, maybe there's someone somewhere that is like, hey, look, we will benefit because people got to benefit or else they won't do something. They will benefit by sending us in to do this research. That research will allow us to really say what they are. We can't do that. So what can we do? What can we do? We can extrapolate where they were going before. Cody was becoming even more. So Cody is a, is a racehorse, right? He's a thoroughbred. He accelerates, he becomes stronger, he becomes faster, he's got a crazy focus, he sees things well. He's got strong attributes, he's sharp, he works really hard, he moves his feet really well, he gets better at things. He's comfortable in the chaos of what fighting is, he's comfortable in seeing the lines in which things are happening, and he does it quite 
instinctively and intuitively. So, and I obviously worked insane, insanely hard since he was a child, and he's quite young still. But the hard work mixed with the attributes is growing the attributes, and it's growing that natural feel of these things. And that the potential of where that can go is really terrifying. Beautiful. Um, TJ and Dwayne and, and, you know, TJ is training a lot with Cub Swanson, which that, honestly, and I know I'm, I'm a complete mark for Cub Swanson, so my view will be shaped by that. But that's a real good training partner to, to have when you're fighting, you know, Cody Garbrandt, man. Cub moves in, in ways like that. He's got that feel and that flow, you know. He, um, maybe doesn't bite down quite as hard on his mouthpiece. And at his best, he is more relaxed than that. But he's a good training partner to have. But, but uh, Dwayne or TJ is more of a, you know, an executor. He can run plays. So that, to me, is what's interesting about this fight. And it's one guy is executing concepts, Brilliant concepts, brilliant ideas, math, physics. And the other guy is trying to float, flow, and feel his way into it. And which one is better? I don't know that there is a better. And ultimately, both kind of feed each other. Because the way that you program T.J. Dillashaw with math and science and lines and numbers and plays, you create through and we something we talked about earlier today you create actual neural pathways in the brain which is why then later they feel it and they just express it they're not they're not they're not doing math they're not going one to two to pivot to step to rhythm they're just doing and so ultimately you end up with a similar machine by moving in two different ways so it's really fascinating it's really really fascinating you know there's so much going on here. And the, the root of what's going on, you know, we see the flaws in how we want to compare them. Well, who's got better striking or who's got harder punches or who kicks better? Is it really any of those things? Is it? Is it really, you know, because the kick that landed, TJ landed a kick or... It, uh, so Cody took, dro uh, dropped him at the end of round one. And TJ will land that kick. I can't remember if he landed it in round two, or, but he will set up that kick and land it from all these different places in ways that are so spectacular. Uh, is it as hard as the guy who kicks the, the uh, baseball bat in half when the, the tie guys hold the baseball bat and they kick it? Yeah. <laughs> like, I've seen others do it too, but, but um, no but it's going to be hard enough. And, you know, and fuck, man, I, I really like watching Dwayne's work. I really like watching where his brain is going to. And it's hard you, you, to keep up is part of what makes you good at your job. Trying to keep up. I don't have to keep up to do what he does. I just have to keep up to understand what it is, what he's as best I can, and what is we're trying to accomplish. And, um, but there are some really cool concepts at play. And Cody through hard work, continuous hard work, ends up kind of creating a similar kind of creature, a similar kind of machine. You know what I mean? These guys are lessons in how to build the perfect fighter. There's not only one way. But ultimately, in five or ten years, someone will come in here and, and or they'll take the best of these things from, Dwayne has a specialized line of thinking, and Cody has trained in multiple different ways, and they'll put all of these things together and understand. But when I'm gonna have to, I'm gonna really spend some time to try to figure out another perspective to add, because, yeah, they move on. They have crazy footwork, you know. They put together in unpredictable combinations. They use things that you believe you know about them against you. Those are all things that are always there in fighting. But what else is happening here, you know? I'm going to spend some time thinking about it. I'm hoping we can come back to this fight before, you know, after um, we're done here in Calgary. I'm going to Edmonton for two days to see some family, and then I'm taking a couple days out of Toronto. And then when I get back, I'm going right into TSN to uh, cover this fight. 
So I'm hoping we can get another thing, especially I'm going to give Dwayne a call. I'm going to Dwayne, if somebody happened to mention to you about this piece, which to be honest, I'm thinking out loud, which is what I love to do. I don't think I've revealed anything new here. I don't think I've really, other than, you know, we're talking about what we could think about and we're exploring who these guys are and why they are. I regret to say that I haven't offered anything up that furthers this conversation. I hope I've made you think because I don't, I hate the idea that I could have wasted your time, but, uh, but you look at what these guys are and how they are. And the big question is not who's got better footwork or who's got better head movement or who's got better power. I don't think that's the conversation. I don't think that's the question. I think the question is what different, these are different animals. These are different martial artists than we've seen. So what are the true perspectives that we can use to learn something from them or to get excited about it or to, to give it some different thought or to go down a neat rabbit hole and explore it? That's the question. The question is, what are the right questions? And they're not the typical ones. So anyways, if Dwayne, if somebody has mentioned to you that, that, I'm, that uh, we're talking about this, I'm going to give you a text that I'm going to reach out and, and hope to even just pick your brain a little. I'm not going to ask for any secrets. And you're not going to give any. But uh, if you would just offer up some of the, the different broad concepts that you're working on, that'll lead me to some deeper investigation, which I will really appreciate. I hope you guys have got something from, from the, the looking at what we're doing here is pretty meta. We're looking at how to look at this. And I know that that's a, a different perspective, but it's not easy. We spend a lot of time saying what fighting isn't necessarily and where our weaknesses are with the language. It requires real hard work to figure out how to, how to solve that. And we're going to try to do that work. And, um, Thank you. Thank you for spending time with me. Thank you to uh, Cody Garbrandt. Cody Garbrandt. Th well, thank you to Cody Garbrandt for being a brilliant fighter we get to analyze. But thank you for, to, for Dominic Cruz and Michael Bisping for uh, sharing stuff with us. And thank you guys for spending the time. If you're listening to the long form on Stitcher, iTunes, or SoundCloud, reach out somewhere. Uh, I've been, we've been seeing a lot of people have been consuming it, and that's really exciting. Um, Mark's a big long form podcast guy and I really like to when I can you know sit down or while I'm running or doing things to consume long form things I think you can it could, they, are, can, they can be the most thought provoking so if you are somebody who is consuming these we appreciate you and, and I know that you're going to be somebody that we're going to interact with quite a bit and, and we're happy you're along for the journey and other than that if you're in Calgary and you didn't come to my show then what the fuck and uh if you're in London, England, or you know someone who is, September 7th in some gangster's castle. And I'm not kidding. We're doing the live show in some crazy gangster's castle. Uh, we asked Bisping about uh, D Dave Courtney. He was like, oh, I know who Dave Courtney is. So we're in Dave Courtney's castle on September 7th doing the live show. Um, if you're in London, you want to come, hit me up on Instagram. Actually, hit me up on Twitter. I don't get all my Instagram things. It's weird. Um, and other than that, blackout.